the Civil War battle series, the Battle of Fort Stedman. Led by select groups of sharpshooters, the weary, muddy troops of the Army of Northern Virginia made one last desperate push to break out of Petersburg. Near Petersburg, Virginia, in the frosty pre-dawn hours of March 25, 1865, a Union sentry in front of Fort Stedman could hear the faint rustle of dry cornstalks quite clearly. I say, Johnny, he shouted as he brought his weapon to full cock, what are you going to do in that corn? Sharpshooters might rule the daylight hours, but at night the opposing pickets, separated by less than 500 feet, often became quite chummy. All right, Yank, I'm just gathering me a little corn to parch, came the answer. All right, Johnny, I won't shoot. A bit later, the Federal asked, I say, Johnny, isn't it almost daylight? I think it's time they were relieving us. Keep cool, Yank, you'll be relieved in a few minutes. The relief the Confederate had in mind, however, was not the kind that the Union private would find to his liking, for all that rustling in the corn had been caused by rebel pioneers dragging aside sections of the Chevaux de Vries, spiked wooden barriers chained end to end to create an opening through which their infantry could attack the Federal lines. Major General John Gordon and Brigadier General James Walker listened anxiously to the banter and then relaxed a bit. Gordon had hatched a plan for his commander, General Robert E. Lee, to strike the Union logistical base at City Point, only ten miles northeast of Petersburg. Gordon hoped the attack would give the Army of Northern Virginia enough breathing space to disengage and join General Joseph E. Johnston's army in North Carolina. Leathery, battle-scarred Major General John B. Gordon organized and oversaw the last offensive of General Robert E. Lee's army. Behind them, only a few hundred yards away, the three divisions of Gordon's 7,500 men's Second Corps formed into columns. Backed by Brigadier General Robert Ransom's North Carolina Brigade and Brigadier General William Wallace's South Carolina Brigade, Gordon had just over 10,000 men in his assaulting force and about half that many in reserve. He had also telegraphed for Major General George Pickett's division, but it was an open question whether it would arrive in time. Sharpshooters, men who made up a picked corps of light infantry, would form the spearhead of the assaulting columns. General Gordon got us to close up around him that night, recalled Oscar Whitaker, a sharpshooter from the 12th Alabama. While he stood on a stump and told us how Lee was situated, what a long line we were having to keep up. In front of us, he said, was Fort Stedman. He told us if we would take it, he would have our names in every paper in the South. Of course, we being old soldiers told him we would do it. He told us for not a man to load his gun and at a signal for him to rush over to the fort knock down and drag out, and he would have 50,000 troops in behind us. The sharpshooters moved as close to the Union picket lines as they dared and lay down. It was around 4 a.m., and early morning fog was just starting to gather in the hollows. The pioneers completed their work, and a group of Walker sharpshooters moved toward the Federal pickets as if to desert. It was not unusual to see armed Confederate deserters at a picket line, and to complete the illusion, their commander, a Tar Heel lieutenant named Jib Edmondson, jumped up and shouted, Oh boys, come back! Don't go! The Southerners quickly overpowered a sentinel, who still managed to bayonet one of them before being knocked senseless and captured most of his compatriots. One man escaped, however, firing off his rifle and yelling, The rebels are coming! The rebels are coming! The sharpshooters followed the fleeing picket, who unwittingly led them back through his own obstacle field. Gordon drew his revolver and fired three quick shots. The signal for the attack. <laughs> Cap 
Captain Joe Anderson, the commander of Walker's sharpshooters, ordered, Forward! Double quick! The men rose and moved swiftly through the pre-dawn darkness at Trail Arms. Colonel Hamilton Brown and Major General Brian Grimes, divisional sharpshooters, took the center route directly toward Fort Stedman, while Walker's men moved left toward Battery 10 and Brigadier General Clement Evans' sharpshooters angled south toward Batteries 11 and 12. To clear the obstacles protecting the Union positions, 50-man pioneer detachments led each attacking column. Hard on the heels of the pioneers came a storming party of a hundred to three hundred sharpshooters, and just behind them marched in the infantry brigades. A company of artillerymen led by Lieutenant Colonel Robert Stribling advanced with them, hoping to turn the Yankee guns on their owners. Once Stedman and his supporting forts and batteries had fallen, the Second Corps infantry would move forward and begin rolling up the Union line from north to south. To help the attack succeed, Gordon had men from the area serve as guides and saw to it that his commanders knew the names of Union officers so that in the semi-darkness they might pass either as retreating Union infantry or Confederate deserters. A cavalry force stayed ready to gallop through the lines to City Point once the Federal works fell. Walker's men, joined by the sharpshooters from Ransom's brigade, reached their objective, Battery 10, a supporting fort just north of Stedman. The pioneers began hacking their way through the defenses, while an assault group under Lieutenant Thomas Rolluck moved up. In a few moments, they were inside the works. Their cheers told General Walker that Battery 10 had fallen, and he started his infantry column forward. Before the Confederate troops could reach their objective, rebel pioneers had to clear wicked-looking Chevaux de Frise out of the way. Inside Fort Stedman, Major George Randall, the commander of the 14th New York Heavy Artillery, serving as infantry, tried desperately to organize a defense. The fort's gunners got off half a dozen rounds of canister, but without result, although Captain Anderson received a mortal wound in the scattered fighting taking place at the rear of the fort. An all-night Yankee card game, liberally lubricated with spirits, was suddenly interrupted when a rebel face appeared in the doorway. Private Hence Proctor, a sharpshooter with the 59th North Carolina, poked his head into another bomb-proof. "'Come out of there,' he demanded. "'I know you are in there.' The Yankee officer inside, still in his nightclothes, grabbed Proctor's long hair and proceeded to belabor the unfortunate sharpshooter about the head and shoulders with his sword until rebel comrades rescued him. Colonel Hamilton Brown and his sharpshooters, meanwhile, crept forward, undetected nearly to Fort Stedman, but they lost their composure and rushed forward, yelling, said a witness, like a bunch of Comanche Indians. Another column of Grimes sharpshooters under Captain Joseph Carson made its way forward after hearing Gordon's signal. Carson was worried about his younger brother Bob, the high-spirited 18-year-old who normally had a safer job as a courier had insisted on joining the attack. Having lost two brothers already, Carson could not shake off the feeling that Bob was next. Nevertheless, he pressed forward at the head of his men, throughout three lines of obstructions as perfect as human ingenuity could make them. They had not gone twenty-five yards when the fort's cannons opened up. Running at top speed, they managed to get under the gun's line of fire without anyone being hit. In a flash of cannon fire, Carson saw his brother tearing away the telegraph wire strung across the abatis. As they pushed through the gap, cannon blasts blew the attackers' hats off. They reached the spike logs protecting the parapet, hacking at them, dragging them out of the way. Unable to climb the slippery parapet and under fire from the infantrymen above, Carson ordered his men to load their rifles and shoot every Yankee who showed himself. His men made it inside after finding a low spot in the parapet. Then they formed into line and began moving forward. Federals began to surrender, first individually and then in groups. 
General Evans had selected Colonel Eugene Wagaman's brigade to lead the drive on Battery 11, and the 400-man brigade stumbled through the darkness, preceded by sharpshooters as an assault group in the 13th and 31st Georgia regiments under Colonel John Lowe. First, over the parapet, were two four-man sharpshooter sections led by Lieutenant Benjamin Smith of the 2nd Louisiana. Hard pressed by the defenders, they held out until help arrived. When the rest of the Louisiana Tigers got there, they found the garrison alerted and subdued them after hand-to-hand -hand fighting. In the fort, resistance swiftly collapsed. General Stribling's men were turning the Union guns on their former owners, and Major Randall was captured as he tried to escape with his regimental colors. Captain Carson quickly sent the prisoners, which he had estimated at more than 500, hustling to the rear. Incredibly, two supporting Federal infantry regiments remained unaware of the attack until sharpshooters scattered the drowsy Federals in wild confusion. They fired no shots, wrote Captain John Dean, the commander of the 29th Massachusetts, but used the butts of their muskets. Much of the regiment was captured, but Color Sergeant Conrad Holman managed to spirit its colors to safety. The 217-man 57th Massachusetts had just time enough to form up and rush to the parapets, only to find the Confederates behind them. Many were taken prisoner. It was still 45 minutes to daylight. The Union Sector Commander, Brevet Brigadier General Napoleon McLaughlin, formed his reserve regiment, the 59th Massachusetts, and double-quicked it north, ordering the mortars in battle. Well, to open up on Fort Simon, McLaughlin sent in the 59th Massachusetts and what he could find of the 57th and 29th to retake it with fixed bayonets. The Massachusetts men went in with a will, carrying Battery 11 and part of Fort Stedman as well, where they captured many sharpshooters. By now, however, the rebel infantry columns of Grimes, Evans, and Walker were beginning to arrive lending their weight to the attack. McLaughlin entered the fort and began directing operations, only to find out that he was giving orders to the wrong army. Lieutenant Billy Wynn, commanding the sharpshooters of the 31st Georgia, appeared out of the darkness and demanded his surrender. Confederate General Gordon entered Fort Stedman, where he relieved General McLaughlin of his command, as well as his sword. Gordon was pleased up to this point, he said. The success had exceeded my expectations. He later claimed that his losses to that point had been only 11 men. Gordon's immediate task was to widen the breach by capturing Forts McGilvery and Haskell, which flanked Fort Stedman. Brigadier General William Terry's brigade crossed to support Wagaman, and the rest of Evans' brigade followed in turn. With these fresh troops in play, the Confederates quickly overran Battery 12 and began moving toward Fort Haskell. On the Union side, the 100th Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvanians from the Newcastle area, was next to feel the force of Wegemans, Louisianas, and Terry's Virginians. The first thing the boys knew, wrote one Keystoner, they were firing down our line from the right to the left of the regiment. The boys were asleep in their bunks at the first volley, but grabbed guns and cartridge boxes, not even stopping to dress. Some were barefoot, some only with shirts and pants on. The regiment had been practically cut in two. The right took shelter in the rear in some old rifle pits, while Companies B and G ran into Fort Haskell. Among those mortally wounded in the fray was the regiment's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph H. Pentecost. The Confederates, meanwhile, continued to press their attack. Still, in spite of the shock and confusion of the assault, there was remarkably little panic in the Federal ranks, certainly not the disintegration Gordon had hoped for. The garrison of Fort Haskell, four companies of the 14th New York Heavy Artillery, a six-gun battery, and a mortar detachment had been warned of the approach of Confederate infiltrators by an alert sentry. 
The party was in two ranks, wrote one man, and had filed into our lines through the gap in the front of Stedman, and was moving upon us as unopposed, for they were between us and our pickets. These Confederates supposed that they were approaching the rear of the little fort, and were moving very confidently, expecting an easy triumph. The fort's gunners double-shotted three of their guns, and with canister, trained them where they expected the column to appear, and weighed it. Soon they heard the whispering voices of the approaching men. Steady! We'll have their works! Steady, my men! A voice urged. A moment later, the command, Now! rang out, and the federal guns' deafening reports rent the air. The Confederates kept trying to advance on the fort, but Gordon had lost his best chance of taking Fort Haskell, a failure that would have dire consequences. In the northern sector, Walker and Ransom's troops pushed toward Battery 9, using the same infiltration tactics that had proved successful elsewhere. A crowd of men came running down the trench, said the commander of the 2nd Michigan, Captain Broughton. Supposing they were one of our regiments and running from the enemy, I stepped out and ordered them to halt, saying it was useless to run away. One of the men put his hand on Botton's shoulders, saying, Come with me. The Yankee captain, realizing he had just been captured, said, In a minute, then stepped back and ordered his men to fire, which they obeyed immediately with good effect. Fifteen of Broughton's men were captured, but he and the rest escaped to Battery 9, where he sent out a company to block a Confederate force, attempting to take the battery from the rear. The rebels, meanwhile, gave up any pretense of stealth and commenced shelling the Federal positions from Fort Stedman. Major Ed Buckby of the 1st Minnesota Sharpshooters, who held the far right of the line, took two companies and moved them over to cover the rear of the Union forts. One of these companies consisted of Chippewa Indians. On his way forward, Buckby literally stumbled over one of Gordon's special operations groups. See, see, shouted one of the Confederates. Shoot that cuss on that horse. Surrender, damn Yank. Buckby spared his horse through more bullets in a square yard than they have ever experienced before, and escaped unscathed. The Chippewas let loose a war cry that put the rebel yell to shame, and went straight at the rebels on the run. The Michigan men claim to have captured four officers and 50 enlisted men. Between Gordon and City Point, the Federals had only the 200th and 209th Pennsylvania and the 100-man 17th Michigan. Union Major General Orlando Wilcox had ordered the Keystone Regiments to march southward, opening the door to City Point. Colonel Brown's rebel sharpshooters moved out from Fort Stedman in open order, crossed Morrison's Creek, and pushed back the 17th Michigan and the remnants of the 57th Massachusetts. As the morning sky lightened, Captain Edward Jones began throwing shells from his three-inch guns in nearby Fort Friend at the column moving on Fort Haskell. Soon, however, shadowy figures began approaching his position through a ravine. Jones had no infantry with him, but he gamely cranked his guns down and blasted the attackers with canister. Gordon, with his men at the gates of Fort Haskell, Battery 9, and Fort Friend, was now within a hair's breadth of victory. But before Gordon could seize the opportunity, Brigadier General John Hartrand, the commander of the 9th Corps Reserve Division of six brand new Pennsylvania regiments, arrived on the scene. Hart Ramp's battle philosophy was brutally simple. It was better to attack than be attacked. Thanks to Wilcox's ill-considered move, however, he had only one unit, the untried 200th Pennsylvania, to assist him. Undeterred, he sent the Pennsylvania farm boys, the 17th Michigan, and the 57th Massachusetts remnants straight toward the rebels. They swept back Brown's sharpshooters and pushed all the way to federal camps at the rear of Fort Stedman until Confederate fire stopped them. Seeing Confederate reinforcements pouring through the Union earthworks, Hartram sent the 200th Pennsylvania, which had fallen back 40 yards or so, back in. 
After losing 100 men during the next 20 minutes, some of the heaviest fighting of the day, the 200th broke and headed rearward. Even so, the general and their officers managed to rally them near where they had started. By now, two more of Hartrand's regiments were hustling to the fighting, firmly barring the rebel way to City Point, and was getting light enough for the Union artillery in the surrounding forts to find the range. For Gordon, on the other hand, the news turned bad. None of his companies had succeeded in taking the Union flanking forts, leaving his plan only half completed at first light. Wagaman's Louisiana Tigers were still driving toward Fort Haskell, however, with the sharpshooters in the lead. The fort's artillery commander, Captain Christian Warner, manhandled a piece to bear on them. Warner opened up with canister while the fort's infantry blazed away with their rifles. One of Warner's gunners, Lieutenant Julius Turk, had an arm blown off while aiming his piece, but the captain, whose life seemed charmed that day, stepped up and finished adjusting the sights. He left a corporal in charge of the gun while he attended to another, whereupon a sharpshooter put a bullet through the corporal's brain. To add to the confusion, some of the other Union forts began to fire at Fort Haskell, thinking it had fallen. Major Randall, who had escaped from Fort Stedman and taken command, sent out a plucky detachment from the fort's rear with orders to wave the colors in the face of the Confederates and show the other batteries they were still holding out. Mm. The ranks of the enemy soon broke under the fire of our muskets and Warner's well-aimed guns, reported Union soldier George Kilmer. But some of the boldest came within speaking distance and hailed us to surrender. The main body hung back beyond canister range near the ravine at the base of the slope, but within range of our bullets. To clinch the fight, the Confederates sent in the sharpshooters. Suddenly, a great number of little parties or squads of three Three to six men each, Gilmer recalled, rose with a yell from the hidings down along those connecting parapets and dashed towards us. The parapets joined on to the fort, and upon these the Confederates leaped, intending thus to scale our walls. Captain Warner fired off his three other guns, recalling some of the rebel squads were cut down, others ran off to cover, and now a few passed on beyond our right wall to the rear of the fort and out of reach of the guns. With this, the aggressive spirit of the famous movement melted away forever. On the north end of the line near Battery 9, the Confederates resorted to a conventional attack. At about 5.15 a.m., Ransom's brigade went forward into a hail of fire from the fully alerted Union artillery in Battery 9 and Fort McGilvery. The rebels broke and retreated under the storm of case shot, but soon tried again, reinforced by Brigadier General Gaston Lewis's brigade from Walker's division. A detachment attempted to take Fort McGilvery from the rear, but was cut off and captured. The troops of the 57th North Carolina, part of Lewis's brigade, hunkered down under the Union barrage, while on the line's far left, the men of the 56th North Carolina frantically dug holes with their bayonets to avoid the Union shellfire and the errant shots of the fellow Confederates. As the sky lightened, Hartman's 2nd Brigade came puffing up, plugging the remaining gaps in his line. Full daylight revealed the desperation of the Confederate position. Fort Stedman lay at the apex of an arc, with Forts Haskell and McGilvery at the ends. Union artillery commanded the ground behind Fort Stedman, making any southern withdrawal a risky business. From there, in the high ground east of Fort Stedman, the gunners of the Ninth Corps sent a hurricane of shells toward the exposed Southerners, driving them to earth. Colonel Stribling and his men returned fire with the captured cannons, but they were running low on ammunition and subject to intense counter-battery fire. His plans in tatters, Gordon gave the order to retreat. Seeing their opponents waver, the Union commanders attacked. The whole field was blue with them, recalled Captain Carson. I think the columns must have been twenty deep. 
Confederate resistance collapsed under the rain of shells and the concentrated infantry assault, private and general alike, scrambled back across no man's land through a shower of shells that Carson remembers screeched and screamed like fiends. Kilmer called it a place of fearful slaughter. My mind sickens at the memory of it, a real tragedy in war, for the victims had ceased fighting and were now struggling between imprisonment on one hand and death or home on the other. Some lay down and was taken prisoner, wrote a Tar Heel soldier, but when I thought of Point Lookout, you better know I come out. General Walker was one of the last Confederates to quit the fort, watching the gallant fight of his sharpshooters as they tried to hold off the Federals long enough for the rest of the division to escape. Suddenly, I heard a shout, he said, and looking in the direction of the sound, I saw a body of Federal infantry coming over the wall of the fort on the opposite side. It was the 100th Pennsylvania, which would always claim that its colors were the first into the fort. Their arrival from the south meant that almost all the sharpshooters outside the fort were cut off. Exercising discretion, the general vaulted the parapet, but the rising sun had softened the frosty ground, and mud soon caked his thigh-high cavalry boots. My speed slackened in a slow trot, and then a slow walk, and it seemed as if I were an hour making the seventy-five yards. Walker made it safely, but many of his men did not. Hartman's Pennsylvanians arrived in the fort minutes later. Captain Carson was one of the rebels to escape, but any relief he felt was tempered by personal tragedy. Just as he had feared, a bullet had found his brother, Bob. Carson commandeered a horse and brought back his brother's body. As I entered our lines again, from which we had gone so hopefully in the early morning, he wrote, I looked back on Fort Stedman. There, in the sunlight, floated again the stars and stripes. When the smoke cleared, the Federals counted more than 1,000 rebel captives, while admitting the loss of just under 1,100 of their own men, half of them prisoners taken in the initial rush. They also prided themselves, when all was over, in losing not a single gun or color. Overall, Confederate casualties topped 2,600 men, among them Major General John Gordon, lucky to have only a flesh wound, and Lieutenant Billy Wynn, shot through both legs. Nearly all my gallant skirmish line was captured, lamented General Walker, so apparently was most of Grimes' line as well, Colonel Brown, and, to judge by the number of sharpshooters who later turned up at Point Lookout, most of his men went in the Federal bag. That was the most serious loss of the day for the Confederates, as those troops had represented a great many of Lee's best remaining soldiers. The victory at Fort Stedman raised the morale of the Federals and correspondingly depressed that of their opponents. It was the last offensive action of the Army of Northern Virginia, which laid down its arms forever, two weeks later, at Appomattox Courthouse. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. And love it.